fits the it fits the whip. Is that how I should how I should say it? Yes, fits the whip is appropriate. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, I want to thank you so much for meeting with us today and sharing a little bit of your story for the the students at um, Turner Fenton. Now, I'm gonna get right into it. When did you know that you wanted to be a boxer? Oh, actually, when I was. When I was younger, um, my father, I got four brothers in my family, there were five boys, and my father started us, my oldest brother in boxing as a form of self-defense. He was getting picked on as a kid, so my father uh, got him in, in the, into boxing. He watched Muhammad Ali and saw that the policeman brought Muhammad Ali into boxing and to, you know, to give him some discipline, respect, and control. So he brought my brother into boxing uh, to learn how to defend himself. And then uh, I've got two older brothers, so that my next older brother started as well, and then myself. And then my two younger brothers eventually started to down the line. Okay, so a whole family of boxers. So, yeah, so it's a family affair. No question. Was your dad a boxer as well? No, my dad was a marathon runner. But, oh, but so he, athletes is still... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah and, and, you know, being a marathon runner, one thing we had to do in boxing was run. <laughs> we were in good shape. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, you know, like I said, being he loved Muhammad Ali, and he just that's what made him uh, bring us into boxing. Okay, lovely. Now... Did the people close to you offer support from the beginning? Yes, yeah. Like I said, you know, I uh, had a family of uh, my, my brothers were all involved with boxing. My mom, my mom was one of the uh, one of the uh, referees, one of the officials. Really? And my dad was a coach, right? So it was a family affair. Lovely. And then what about friends and the industry? Well, when we, when we started boxing, I mean, you know, there, there was really nothing to be said. I mean, we were successful off the get-go, you know, winning fights and bringing recognition to the city of Kitchener. So there's nothing to be said. I mean, it was just, it was there, we were doing great, and we are always in the paper, right? we were doing good things. Nice. Now, so at this point in time, as when you got in, was there anyone around you, okay, not not close to you, but I guess those around you that tried to discourage you from pursuing your goal as a, a boxer? Um, well, you'd hear people at the odd time saying, you know, oh, you can't do it, uh, or no, you're not good enough, but you know what I mean? It's one of those things where, you know, my dad believed in us, and uh, you know, he kept us, uh, Kept us in the in the sport of boxing, and it was, a, it was a way to make sure that I mean at those at that point we were in our teenage years too, right? So as the kids were growing up, you know, he knew that he had to keep us busy doing something, mm -hmm. and he figured, you know, if I can get these kids in here and they're boxing in the ring more so than on the streets, getting the trouble, they're fighting, mm -hmm. then I, I got them where I want them, right? Yeah, Which is doing positive things. Yes. Um, what were some challenges that you faced as a boxer? Um, well, as a boxer, I mean a lot of uh, some of the big challenges were really more or less, uh, you know, financial, right? Being able to get the equipment needed, whatever at the time. Um, also, you know, finding a good training facility or being able to you know, uh, pay for the gym dues and stuff, right? So that was uh, a big thing. And like I said, being as we had all the boys involved, you know, going down the line, you know, it became somewhat of an undertaking. What is that? Because you said it was four. It's four. This is a four. And what? Uh, where were you in terms of? I'm, uh, I'm actually right in the middle. I'm in the, I'm in the middle. So you're third. Yeah, third child. I'm third too. Yeah. Something you said so, for the third one. You gotta. You're not. Yeah. You're not the first, but you're not the last. You kind of have to kind of work a little, a little bit. You, know. you, you definitely. I mean, there's, there's a, I have the third child syndrome, as you all know, and you have to work your way to earn what you want. <laughs> get that child. It's amazing if you have a conversation with someone else about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, the third. One. There is something he said for that. <laughs> there is. Okay, so the challenges was really the financial, trying to make sure that you guys had enough funds to cover, you know, whatever was required. Yes. Yeah. Now, how did you find success? Well, to me, um, you know, I've said before, uh, I, I define success. Uh, I, I don't measure it in terms of dollars and cents. I measure it in terms of accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Did you set your goal? Did you achieve that goal? Okay, because you can be rich and not really necessarily, I mean, you know, be successful. That doesn't mean you're successful because you're rich. Because there's a lot of people who have money but still have a lot of problems and that success is not necessarily there. Whereas you can have people who don't have money but who accomplish those goals. And the rich, richness is right in here. Yeah. It's within here. Yeah. So when you set that goal, if you, you sit and you say, I have a dream. My dream is to be the best or be the champion of the world or the best in what I want to be. And you accomplish that goal. You, the money may not necessarily come. And I'm speaking from experience too. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, I mean, but, but yeah, I mean, so I have been very successful. Define actually financial. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would be nice, but the yes. test to me is when you get an opportunity to select to go and work towards and actually achieve it. Yes. That is true success. Because you said there's some people that are extremely rich, 
but yet on the outside they look successful, but on within they probably yeah. are not because they're not happy. Yeah. But true happiness, um, I guess happiness and success to me they coexist co together. Right. You know, so if you're um, if you're successful but you're not happy, if outside will deem you as successful, but if you're yes. not happy, you're not necessarily successful within in terms of your terms. Yes. Research and one of the lessons I've learned from putting this together is to truly do take the time and you get to know um, successful black people from the past. Yeah. And what did they have to go through? What did, they, what did they bring to the world? What did they bring to Canada as a whole? And how do um, how to, to make sure that myself now that I know and share that information with others. I think is what I, you know, from putting putting this research together, realize that yeah, it's so important for all of us as black people to and especially here in Canada. Especially when I started the research, all the names I could think about, unfortunately, was a lot of Americans. And, yeah. not, re yeah, and not realizing, and I'm going to say, I don't think that's probably what I did was unique to you know, others. You know, um, or sorry, what I, what I was in, in terms of the research that I was doing, I don't think it was unique for me just you know, thinking of the whole first thinking of this, thinking of that. There's a lot of an incredibly incredible black people here in Canada. Yes. And I think it's important as a black Canadian to make sure that I know and others out there get to really know you know that there's incredibly black incredible successful black people here in Canada. Yeah. Well, I know I know exactly what you're saying because even as still myself as a, as a boxer, as a you know as a Canadian world champion, um, living in, in, in Kitchener here, I mean I was sometimes overshadowed, overlooked because they think about you know, they think, okay, well, if he's a, you know, a world champion, we'll have to be living in the States. Exactly. And they don't realize that, okay, you know what, like, I mean, I've said in many interviews here, in the state, I'm down that, you know, people don't even know that there's a world champion living here in yeah. Kitchener. Yeah. They think that, okay, if you're a world champion, you're going to be in Las Vegas or somewhere in the States. Exactly. And I'm like, guys, you know what, I mean, I stay here to show you guys that it could be done. Uh, I'm here, I'm living proof of it. And, you know, it's even a lot of my students here in Virginia, you know, like, like, understand the grass. You know, um, I just I asked them, you know, I just have left to do some research to try to find out see that, you know, because it's one of those things where they kind of say, well, you know, it's one of those things, you know, you don't manage your God until it's gone, you know, and, uh, yeah, I think that's really, yeah. Uh, it's important thing. that we do, you know, make sure that we get to know who those people are, so I'm really celebrate them in terms of saying yourself, and, you know, just make, like, yeah, make sure that we celebrate them, yeah. and tell you thank you. Thank you. Um, can you describe your journey from teenage years to where you are now in regards to being a boxer and now owning your own gym? Um, well, you know, it was uh, it was a tough road. I mean, you know, I had to uh, just keep, uh, I mean, even, you know, like I said, coming back when, when I had actually quit boxing in my early teens, uh, 84, one after I quit in 84, I came back after Washington, 88, so I came back in 89, so I was four and a half, almost five years hiding from boxing. I came right back and I, you know, became provincial champion. I was fighting the Canadian champion every time uh, at the Olympics, uh, sorry, at the Nationals. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I was trying to the 92 Olympics. And I had already lost him six times in a row. The seventh time, this was the Olympic trials for Barcelona, in Spain. And I actually beat him in that fight to go to the Olympics. But then they said that the rules were changed. You had to beat the, to beat the champion twice. Mm -hmm. I was the only challenger to beat a champion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I had to fight him again a second time with a new computer scoring system, and they made sure that he had enough points that he was the one who was heading towards the Olympics. That was one of those things where they asked me, they said uh, they came back, and I guess he went to the Olympics when he came back, he won a silver medal. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the media came to me and they said, you know, they said, Fitz, how do you feel about, uh, about not coming back with a, with a silver medal? And I said, well, if, if Canada is happy for the silver medal, then I am happy for Canada. I had to go on from there and decide, you know, that I'm going to go on and uh, leave this amateur sport and go on and chase my dreams of becoming a world champion as a pro. So uh, in 1993, I, I made the embarkment and I set out to become a, to become a world champion. You know, I just had that vision and I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. Now it's something that hadn't been done. Uh, nobody had done it in the city before and I was like, well, I was leaving a full-time job. I see a full-time job. I was leaving in 1993, and they're like, you know, you're crazy to leave this full-time job with vacation, and like that. And I, I said, you know, I said, I'm only young once. If I don't try now to, to live my goals and dreams now, you know, when I'm older, I'm 
my faith, but I can come out to this job when I'm, when I'm older. I said, but I can't go into boxing when I'm older. So I got to go and try it now. I'm going to that you want to make sure that you fulfill your goal and your dream. So like you said, uh, a life of regret. I don't want to say you could have, should have. Right. Right. And, and that's what I saw in my older brother. Because he, he quit at a point. He just, I was, I heard him keep saying, well, I could have beat this one. I could have beat this one. I could have beat And I was like, I'm like, I was, I didn't like to keep hearing that. So, you know, I said, you know, I'm not going to say the same thing myself. And that's why I came back after four and a half years off, you know. I said, you know, I'm going to get out there and do what I know I can do. And I always keep it that way. Because, like I said, it would have been a shit. Who likes to hear that? What does that mean? What does that mean? Exactly. You know, when you're sitting on your deathbed now, when you slow down, you really can't do anything but think. Yeah. I just don't want to be having those kind of thoughts going through Yeah. Right? You, I'm sure um, when, you, when you do slow down, you're not going to think, I wish I didn't leave that job. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to say that. Are you happy with this stage in your life? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm happy with this stage, but you know, there's still a lot of things that I want to do, and I have set out there that I'm still going to accomplish. I mean, I you know, I'm, you know, I'm in the in the books and the history books and stuff, but I'm, it's not done. There's there's still a lot more of that for me, and uh, you know, I'll tell you something. You know, they say you know you're, you're getting older. And, I say age is just a number. It's a lifestyle. It's how you feel. And it's what you really, really want to set up and accomplish as far as goals and stuff in your life. So I'm young. Because I've still got a lot of people to do. And I've still got a lot of goals to do. And when I say it's possible, with hope, it is possible. You better believe that. Exactly. And you know what? Question for you. What made you come up with that acronym? Well, I hope it's possible with. You know, I should, when I when I came up with the acronym, I was just sitting and I'm like, you know what? I said, what would you mean? I said, the words actually meant something. Like, just like, because, uh, you know, the word was something I just said, well, we just kind of sit there and it would go. So I said, let me try to put something out there. Yeah, you know, put something out there. And I did, yeah, you know, and I had a couple of different things. I said, you know, put the whole spot And that's what I used to with. And I said, you know, this, this is great. What a great thing. Yeah. And because they tell you, you know, they told it is possible to believe in yourself. You want to accomplish everything you want to sell there? You want to make the soccer? I tell kids that if you want to make the soccer price to dedicate yourself to something, go ahead and put it on. You just come out to work hard and go out there and chase those dreams, chase those goals. You can do it, you know? I love that, and that leads us to the last question. What advice would you show the students come? Well, I would tell them, like I said, same thing, you know what I mean? You know, if they have a goal and they have a dream, something that they want to accomplish, you know, just believe in yourself. Like, it comes first within you. If you, if you believe in you, there's something in the world, then those around you don't radiate it. Those around you don't get that sunshine and never like, wow, you know, it's just, I can't get on board. It can't be done. Let's hope it is positive. Believe in yourself. You can do whatever you want to. Well, thank you. And you know, with that being said, this, I really appreciate you taking the time and I really enjoyed um, this conversation. And I definitely hope that in the future we can talk again and share more with the students out there. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to interview me. Thank you. Thank you.